So today I'll be talking about um, harmony, basically, and how I think about harmony in terms of the circle of fifths. So um, I came to start thinking about harmony in terms of the circle of fifths kind of slowly over the course of, of most of my life uh, being a musician. And um, I think I started thinking in terms of the circle of fifths when I started thinking modally because I'm a guitar player and playing rock and stuff and, and I was always curious about music theory and one of the first things that I started looking at was scales and modes. So um, one of the first things I, I started playing around with in when I was writing was you know the difference between Aeolian right away I wouldn't use any of the other modes because I was playing metal and the other modes were too happy right <laughs> so that was already something that I was noticing is that there are some modes that are too happy to be used in metal and then of the usable ones you want to use Phrygian when you want something darker because of this flat 2 thing right it's more metal and then um, Aeolian when that wasn't so necessary So already I was thinking, kind of, you know, at least at a subconscious level in terms of darkness and brightness, you know? And uh, then at some point I had picked up this book called, it's out of print, and it's called um, La Honey Jazz in Approche Didactique, and I couldn't even find it, like I don't know who wrote it or anything. I, it was photocopied off my guitar teacher, and it, it explained the different modes as being seven notes that are adjacent to each other on the circle of fifths. So imagine F to B, so just the white notes, right? Um, and the brightness of the mode, dependent on where the fundamental or the, the root of that scale was on the circle of fifths. So the further the root was anti-clockwise in relation to the other notes, uh, the brighter the mode would be. So for example, uh, Lydian is if you've got the F in the bass with all of the other notes um, covered. So in this case, it sounds really bright. You've got the augmented fourth, you've got, you know, and it sounds like a, a kind of bright positive sound. If you put uh, then, for example, the G in the bass, keeping the same notes, the white notes on the keyboard, then it sounds a little less because of this flat seven, it doesn't sound quite as bright. It doesn't have the bright positive sound of Lydian. So it's going a little bit darker, right? And then if you go further and further, you get uh, Dorian, which sounds more minor, but it also has the natural sixth, right? Or the major sixth. And then Aeolian, which we've already talked about, so now a usable mode in metal. And finally, uh, you end up with Phrygian. So you're going darker and darker as the uh, fundamental moves further and further clockwise in relation to the other notes. Um, so that was definitely one thing, and in jazz we think in terms of the circle of fifths a lot in that too, and I have some experience playing jazz. Um, and so that was one thing that was feeding into my compositional process a lot. And then when I started composing um, in university, I noticed some things that I would consistently do uh, when I was writing chord progressions. So for one thing, I would notice, sometimes I would think about a chord that I wanted and I would think about it in terms of my bodily reaction to that chord. So I want a chord that's like this, like really open, super bright, and so I would play something like, right? Or even, you know, really positive and bright. And then if I wanted something that would be kind of closed down and negative, you know, I could even take this chord and just do a little change and it'll all of a sudden be more negative like that. And now it's like, mm, this isn't so positive anymore. And I could even, you know, so the voicings between this chord and this chord 
are almost the same, but the result in terms of what I feel in my body is completely different. Um, and the same thing happened with chord progressions. I would notice that I would do certain things and I would play a chord progression and it would feel like I'm opening up. Whereas you could do the opposite and it feels like it's kind of closing down. were sort of the implicit things that I noticed that I was always doing. I was thinking in terms of my body, I was thinking in terms of this duality between dark and bright things, and I noticed that it had a lot to do with the circle of fifths. So at some point, I needed to ask myself some specific questions so that I could formulate a way of working with this. As composers, we all know, like, you know, it's, it's really difficult to work with pitch when you're not working in the tonal system or the modal system or something pre-made. So hopefully you're gonna be doing something that's based on perception, but that's really hard. Like how do you, even the tonal system and stuff like that, it's based on perception, but implicitly. It's not, they didn't formulate a theory of oral perception and then create the tonal system, right? It developed very slowly. So it's, it's a massive task for a composer to try and create a system for working with pitch. It's really, really difficult. So. I decided that I wanted to answer, I mean, these questions kind of came about slowly, but the two main questions are, why do some chords sound uh, simple, whereas others sound complex? And this is applied to chord progressions as well. So some chord progressions sound like you're going from one chord to another, and it's really jarring. Whereas in other cases, you move from one chord to another, and it seems smooth, even though the voice leading can be, like, it might have nothing to do with the voice lead. Right, just as an example, you know, here to here, it seems like you're not doing anything really that jarring. Whereas if you do something like to, right, even if the voice leading is um, maybe not uh, about the same in both cases, you know, the bass here only moves by a semitone, it seems like in this case, really moving to a, a distant key center and it, there's something jarring about it. So it's a more complex chord progression, you can say. And then the second question is, uh, why is it that some chords or chord progressions sound like they're bright and positive, whereas others sound dark and negative? So I call this sharpness, the positive, happy thing, and negative um, is flatness. So. Uh, that's basically what we're gonna be talking about. So the first thing is I needed to find a way of actually calculating complexity on the circle of fifths. So the way I'm gonna go about this presentation is first I'm gonna talk about um, analysis, and then I'm gonna talk about composition because it's, it's um, easier for us to get it into our ears that way, but it was the other way around in, in actual, chronologically, the way that I worked it out. It was composed first, and then I figured out a way to to make tools to analyze music with. So um, the first thing I needed was a way of thinking about complexity on the circle of fifths. So I noticed uh, I took as a kind of fundamental axiom the idea that when two notes are further apart on the circle of fifths, the resulting sonority is more complex. The closer they are, um, the simpler the sonority. So in this case, I decided I'm just gonna make a simple calculation. Um, you literally just count the number of steps between the two notes on the circle of fifths, and that gives you the complexity value of that interval. So C to G, it's just one step away. So it's a complexity of one. If you have C to A, and this is the same thing if it would be, for example, F to D, it's the same number of steps. It doesn't need to start from C. Uh, C to A, is going to have a complexity of three because you go C, G, D, A, right? And then based on that, you can have um, a list of all of your possible intervals and the complexity of them. So um, you see that a perfect fifth or a perfect fourth, those have a complexity of one, so they sound kind of neutral and bare. Uh, there's not a ton of color in them in the sense that it doesn't sound like happy or sad really. It, it sounds nice but, but not like a, a, a 
there's no particular color to them necessarily. Um, then the next one is major seconds or major ninths and minor sevenths. Then we get major sixths and minor thirds, major thirds and minor sixths, then major sevenths and minor ninths, and finally the tritone. And as you go along that, maybe you don't agree with the exact placement of every single one of them. You could say that, oh, a major sixth is uh, maybe equally complex to a um, minor sixth or something like that. You could argue that. But overall, it seems the trend seems to make a lot of sense psychologically. We hear this, a tritone, it's clearly more complex than a perfect fifth, right? So, so the poles are in the right order. And then if you compare um, other examples between, say, a, a minor seventh and a major seventh, the major seventh sounds a lot more complex, like kind of more grating and more, like there's more juice in it, kind of. So, uh, so this kind of made sense, and I figured, okay, I, this is a good starting place. Uh, from that, then, you can find ways of actually calculating the complexity of a chord. That's where it gets tricky, and if you really want to get into the details of it, I've got an Excel spreadsheet that does these calculations, <laughs> like, automatically. But the way that it works is, basically, I take the um, average of all of the intervals of the chord. Often when we think about these things, we think about all of the intervals in relation to the bass, but then that doesn't take into consideration the exact voicing of the chord. So I take all of the, the intervals. Um, and that's, so that means uh, in this major seventh chord, you've got perfect fifth from the bass, major third, major seventh, and then the intervals from the tenor, and the interval from the alto. So in a four note chord, you've got six intervals. But if you just take the, um, the average of all of them, then it doesn't take into consideration some important things, like how close are the intervals in the chord, and how low down are the intervals. So those are the two things that influence our perception and things that I needed to account for by weighting the averages um, when I do the calculation. And I weight them logarithmically, and, and there's a specific way that I do that too. Uh, but um, basically the two perceptual phenomena that happen are as following. So the first one is the lower note weighting. It seems like the lower the interval is in the chord, the uh, more it has an impact on our perception of complexity. So if you have, for example, C, G, C, G on the circle of fifths, they're all close together, and then you put a B way at the top. Um, this chord doesn't sound necessarily super complex, but if you were to take this B and put it down in the bass, then all of the intervals above that bass note would be complex in relation to the bass. Now they're all complex in relation to the soprano, but that makes less of an impact than having them all complex in relation to the bass, right? You hear this and it sounds a lot more complex, kind of more grating, more dissonant than this. This almost seems like the resolution of this, right? So this, so right away you can say, okay, that makes sense, because you know if you want to make something sound really, really complex, put the complex intervals in the lower notes of the chord, right? We see that in spacings all the time, right? In the way that we space chords, even in barbershop, you know, you've got the fourths and fifths between the bass, you know, uh, the bass and, and the lead. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the proximity weighting. So I'll take an example for this one. Um, let's say you have this chord. This sounds complex, but I could play it in a way that's a lot more complex if I take these four notes and transpose them down an octave. Now it sounds like a cluster, right? So the way that that worked was what I did was, in this situation, all of the adjacent intervals are simple intervals. All major seconds and perfect fourths. And so all of the complex intervals, like the minor ninth and the tritone, are far away from each other. There are a lot of intervening notes in between those two. You almost don't hear that there's a minor ninth in this chord, right? 
because the other notes in between kind of mask it. So the other thing that we need to take into consideration is that um, adjacent notes have twice the perceptual weight of notes. I mean, this is a heuristic that I'm using, uh, which could be changed. But definitely there's a perceptual phenomenon going on uh, in terms of the proximity and how many notes are in between two notes. Um, but intervals that are adjacent seem to have double the amount of perceptual weight as those that have one note in between them. And those have double the perceptual weight of those that have two notes in between them, and so on and so forth. So it's logarithmic, just like the lower note weighting. And then I've got a way of uh, calculating um, uh, like a, a kind of weighting process so that I can compare chords with the different numbers of notes. That's, that's the little formula at the bottom. But again, that's not so important, just to understand the perceptual principles. Um, so here we can actually hear some chord progressions now with complexity calculations actually done. So in this case, um, one thing to say is that almost all of the complexity calculations uh, of chords tend to be between uh, a, a range of one is, is the simplest you can get, unless you've just got an octave, then it, it'll be zero. Uh, one is the simplest, but you know if you have a three note chord or more, it's almost impossible to have a complexity of less than two or so. You know, So two is about the lowest you're gonna get. It's a very simple sonority if you see a complexity of two. And then about the most complex you can get is seven or eight. Uh, it's really hard to, you know, it's, it's actually difficult to write a chord that has a, a normal voicing other than just like a massive cluster um, that isn't, uh, that, that is above seven. So, uh, so I'll play this chord progression and you'll hear that at the beginning, the chords sound kind of neutral, bare. So I'll just play a few, right? And then as we go along, they get increasingly complex. So in the middle, they might sound more colorful in the ranges between three and five, let's say. And then at around six, you get chords that you can't make using just diatonic notes. So you need to start spreading out on the circle of fifths a lot to get things past six. So you're starting to get things that are, are pretty dissonant. And then when you get to seven, right, it's much more of a complex scenario. So I'll just play this example. So, I mean, I think we can all pretty much, I, I have no idea, but it seems like most people I talk to uh, can hear this and hear this the same way as me. And so that's the next interesting thing, is that last semester I had a, a course, um, and in this course it was called, a, uh, in the seminar it was called the Perception of Compositional Structures. And uh, the final project was to make and uh, do an actual perceptual experiment. And so what we did in my group is uh, we tested this complexity thing. Uh, and it turned out that the, um, basically we had five participants. I mean, this isn't like I wouldn't publish this, obviously. Um, but <laughs> so we had five participants in the class that kind of knew what was going on. And um, uh, we had them rate the complexity of chords uh, that they heard, and they were all controlled for, so they all had very similar uh, voicings. Uh, they were all for piano. They all started on the same bass note, and they all had the same number of notes in them. And the, <coughs> as you can see, the, uh, the ratings that the participants gave were incredibly close to the just mechanical calculations that, that the system does. Uh, the correlation coefficient was for five people was 0 0.8735, which is seems to be really high. Like you read things and if there's a correlation coefficient above like 0 0.7, it's like, wow, like this is really highly correlated. So it seems to, it seems to make sense. So that's complexity. 
Um, the next thing is sharpness and flatness. Um, so whereas complexity is just distance on the circle of fifths, sharpness and flatness is um, distance. Uh, it's, it also takes into consideration directionality from bottom to top note. So uh, what I noticed was that positive or sharp intervals, what I call sharp intervals, um, always have the characteristic of the bass note being further anti-clockwise in relation to the top note. So if the top note is clockwise in relation to the bottom note, you've got a sharp interval. And the further it is clockwise, the sharper it sounds, the brighter it sounds, kind of. So a major third has a, an SF, which is like a sharpness, flatness value of plus four, because you're moving four notches to the right, clockwise. Whereas a minor third is anti-clockwise in relation to the bass, and it has a sharpness, flatness, and SF value of minus three. And so then we could look at all of the possible intervals. Uh, so perfect fifth is plus one, uh, major second is plus two, major sixth. So it seems like it gets more and more bright and also more and more complex. Uh, but kind of more and more colorful as you go. At first it's kind of bare. And you get brighter and brighter. Uh, same thing for negative distances, where you start off with the perfect fourth, and there's the minor seventh, minor third, minor sixth, minor ninth, and diminished fifth. Now, the tritone is a complicated kind of question. Um, I'll, I'll get into that in questions if, if anyone wants to know. Um, so we can already start now thinking about like hearing chords and, and seeing whether this kind of makes sense or not. So I'll play a few chords. Uh, the bottom left chord is a sharp chord. And by the way, I calculate the SF values the same way as for complexity, except instead of just taking the absolute distances, now I'm also taking into consideration the directionality, right? So um, sometimes you can have a chord that has um, an SF value of zero, but it'll be, it could be very simple or very complex. You don't know. If it's very complex um, and it has an SF of zero, that could mean that it has lots of very sharp intervals and lots of very flat ones. So something like this, for example, right? You've got flat intervals in it, and you've also got sharp intervals in it. So both of them kind of cancel each other out, and you end up with something that has a sharpness, flatness of zero. But if we look at things that are just purely sharp or flat for the moment, uh, sharp chords will tend to sound more bright, open, positive, major-like, kind of happy, you know? And so here's an example. This one has an SF of plus three. Uh, in contrast, uh, the next chord at the bottom there kind of sounds more mellow. If you look at the, the thing with the arrow up there, um, flat chords that are a little bit flat, like around the two or three range, uh, will be kind of maybe sounding mellow or sad or something. And then as you get more and more flat, for example, this next chord, the third chord at the bottom, now you end up with things that are more dark and kind of, you can even say like depressing or kind of starts to sound evil, you know? Right? Uh, whereas if you have this by contrast, it kind of just sounds mellow. It doesn't sound evil anymore, right? So there's this concept of not just flat and sharp chords, but the flatter you go, the more negative it gets, and the sharper you go, the more positive it gets. So the example the sh with sharp chords is, here's the first chord at the bottom, uh, so it has plus three, and then this one's even more positive, this has uh, an SF of plus five, it's a major seventh chord, right? And what's interesting is that this is also a major seventh chord, but just in inversion. You flip the notes around and you end up with a flat chord, right? Positive, So that's the kind of 
dichotomy that I'm thinking in terms of. So uh, here's another example of a chord progression now using sharpness and flatness. What it's doing here is we're alternating between sharp chord, flat chord, sharp chord, flat chord. And you can see the analysis below in the red lines there. So you start off slightly sharp and slightly flat chords, and then you go sharper and sharper and flatter and flatter with each alternating chord. So that gives you an idea of the kind of different sounds that those two things make. Um, so that covers two of the things that I wanted to talk about, and those are why two of the questions I had, and one of them was why do some chords sound simple and others complex, and the other one was why do some chords sound positive and others negative. Now the question is applying this to chord progressions, right? So I've talked about basically how I think about vertical structures, now it's horizontal structures is the question. And it seems to work based on the same principles, like if you're moving, except instead of thinking in terms of um, sharp wise from bottom to top, now you're thinking um, horizontally from uh, you know, before to after. So if you move clockwise on the circle of fifths, and we've all got a bit of experience of this, if you move clockwise, say from a C major chord to an E major chord, it seems like you're going in a positive direction. Whereas if you go to something that's flatter, like a Neapolitan chord, it's like, like right away, just my, the way that I uh, uh, responded to those chords is telling. I mean, I can't play the C to E major and, and go like this. It just seems wrong to me. It's not sad. I can't possibly frown at this, you know? Whereas it, it, the opposite of tr is true if I go to the Neapolitan chord. I can't go, <laughs> like it just seems wrong. There's something weird about the fact that that actually seems wrong for me to do that. So then the question is, okay, so we can talk about that with major and minor chords. You know, you know that a C major chord to an E major chord, of course you're moving that way. But then for contemporary music, you don't necessarily know where the chord is. There isn't necessarily a fundamental to the chord, right? So you need to figure out where is this chord on the circle of fifths? And the simplest answer to that is basically uh, this uh, little graph that I've got um, on the screen. Yeah, eat uh, popcorn if you want. <laughs> don't worry about sound. <laughs> so uh, the simplest answer is just thinking in terms of uh, the circle of fifths is kind of a clock, and the, the average position of the notes on the circle of fifths is kind of where uh, most of the harmonic energy kind of is, right? So um, again, I apply a weighting process to the bass notes, so the bass note is worth twice as much as the tenor, and so on and so forth. So for this chord, uh, you see the notes up on the screen there. Um, you just look at those notes and the notes that are circled and you go, okay, those notes are about at one o'clock, right? But if I were to actually change the voicing so that it would be something like this, then I'm putting more weight in the lower register on notes that are further anti-clockwise so the calculation would change and it would actually tilt the scale so that it would sound like it's closer to the B flat when I put the B flat in the bass. And we can hear that it sounds like there's a harmonic change going on there. And then it's kind of relaxing to go to that chord. So um, now thinking in terms of this dichotomy of sharpness and flatness horizontally, you could say that uh, you're thinking in terms of sharp-wise motion and flat-wise motion on the circle of fits. So uh, sharp-wise motion tends to cause at least to the way that I hear it, it seems to sound like you're going, you're moving towards brightness, towards something uh, 
like happier in some sense or something like that. It seems uplifting. It might seem like it's increasing tension, but tension isn't exactly the right word. It's like, it's like you're, um, there's almost maybe a sense of expectation or something like that, like you're moving towards something positive. Um, whereas flatwise motion is the opposite. It's kind of like uh, you're moving towards relaxation. And we could, you know, the classic example of that is just, right? Where you're literally moving towards relaxation in that sense, where you're going dominant to tonic and you're moving flatwise. Um, so uh, I'll just play some examples of these chord progressions. First, sharp-wise motion. In this example, you see the AP here. You could just think of it in terms of uh, um, uh, like, like time on a clock. It's like you're moving um, clockwise. You're starting at 1 o'clock and going to 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4, 6 o'clock. So you're going forwards, and so you get this um, sharp-wise motion. Whereas if you hear the opposite, it seems more kind of relaxing or something. Like me, when I hear the difference between the two, flatwise motion kind of makes me want to like relax into my seat. If you hear this one again, it's like, I don't know, that's just how my body responds to it. And, uh, Sharpwise motion seems to do the opposite. It's like I want to stand up or something. I don't know if everyone has these reactions, but that's literally like I want to get up when I hear a chord progression like that. So, so if you want to rile people up, now you know what to do. Um, but you can do the same thing, not just in, in linear chord progressions, but also just jumping from one pole to another. So uh, at the bottom here, we've got uh, four chords that are all kind of around noon and then you jump to like five o'clock basically and you hear that there's a, a clear jump in harmonic motion like you're staying around the same pole and then all of a sudden bang you're in a, a different harmonic space It's not like the voice leading was that big either, you know, going from to, I mean, the bass note, granted, is staying stable uh, and then changing. But there's something that's, there's more to it than just voice leading, right? And then in this case, the opposite happens. You stay around a steady kind of tonal center, you can think of it as that, and then you move flatwise. get that sensation of it's like you sit back in your seat when you hear a chord like that you know so that's how I hear it. Um, now you can apply this to analysis so I did an analysis of um, Ligeti's continuum it's a piece for harpsichord and uh, I'll go through the analysis first and then play it because I can't play the whole thing multiple times um, this is just a reduction of it um, what you get is uh, the first section, I'll show you some graphs. So what happens is the complexity values are in green. So you see that the complexity goes up, uh, there's kind of a spike, then it, it's like super saturated, and then it gets less complex again. Um, and what happens is that when the chords are extremely complex, it's like imagine on the circle of fifths, if something is complex, it's because the notes are really spread out on the circle of fifths, right? So um, when the chords get super complex, you can't say where it is anymore on the circle. And that's why this AP calculation in blue here, um, I just remove it at a certain point because it doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, you'd see the values jump all over the place and stuff. It doesn't make any sense. Like, it, obviously, <laughs> you know, this is done with just an Excel file, like doing these calculations. And clearly, we're not hearing it as jumping all over the place like that anymore when the chords are like this, you know? So uh, it's as if we can't hear a stable harmonic center anymore. And then when it emerges again, when it gets less complex, um, you emerge in a new place. So you're in one harmonic area. 
it seems to barely move, then it emerges in a new harmonic area, and from there you get clear sharp wise motion for the second like half of this example. Also in the first half, you start off um, with flatter sonorities, and then um, when it gets complex uh, and re-emerges, you end up with sharper sonorities. And at some point, um, you'll see in, in the graph the last few chords here, uh, 26 and 27, you actually get like a real jump in sharpness with chords like this. And it's really like the combination of sharper chords and sharp wise motion creates like a really powerful impact. And it's really simple the way he does it too. So uh, let's just hear that. So think about it in terms of two sections, first section flatter, then very complex, then reemerges and moves towards sharpness. last, uh, the third to last and, and second to last chord, that I find that it sounds like the sun comes out all of a sudden, you know? You've got this sonority and then he does it quickly. He doesn't go and then kind of hang out there for a while. Like he, he all of a sudden introduces this major sonority and then right away immediately introduces the major seventh right after. So he doesn't get you used to the positiveness and then you know, like slowly and didactically, he, he really makes it happen one right after the other, and it makes it seem like all of a sudden, poof, like just with two additions of two notes, it's like the sonority changes entirely. So I'll just play the end again. It's really interesting. to that that point of, of this brightness then he gets complex again and then moves off to somewhere else so it, it really works well you know and very very simple materials and stuff too so yeah um, now I'll talk about uh, that's the only analysis I've got of a piece um, I'll talk about how I use this in actual composition so the first thing I noticed was like okay you've got this idea of, of what's going on perceptually in terms of the circle of fifths. How do you actually use that to compose? Because you can't just say, okay, well, my basic building block is gonna be the entire circle of fifths. And you can't think of individual intervals because your brain is just gonna explode, right? And at first I was trying to compose things and you know, start off with a stack like this and then try to change somehow the voicings and then introduce flat notes. But it was like, You'd end up, uh, it would be really, really hard to write a chord progression, first of all. It just takes too much processing power. Um, and 
your sonorities aren't necessarily going to be coherent. Even if you've got a clear, like, sharp-wise, flat-wise motion and all this stuff, it doesn't mean that there's going to be an inner kind of um, quality to the sound that makes it consistent. And so what I realized was, okay, I need a basic building block. And I figured the best basic building block is uh, trichords, so just sets of three notes. And three notes is perfect because I think uh, there's only uh, 19 possible trichords, you know, that if you don't include transpositions. And seven of those are um, mirrors of another trichord. So if you consider the mirrors as being just the same trichord flipped around, then you've only got 12. So it's really easy to memorize 12 chords, right? And with those 12 chords, you can make any sonority you want, really, as long as, you know, if you stack one on top of the other and stuff like that. Um, so already that's like, okay, I can memorize this. If I would have used four note chords, then you've got like 48 or something like that. And it's like, that's too much to, to handle. Uh, my brain doesn't, can't do that. <laughs> no. So then the next thing is to order them in some sort of way. So I ordered them according to complexity. So trichord one is the simplest trichord, and that one is just literally stacked fifths. So as you can see, it's the closest possible configuration of three notes on the circle of fifths. So that'll be that'll give you the simplest sonority. Then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got something that's very unclear as, as to where it is on the circle of fifths, because it's the most spread out possible. So this is the most complex trichord you can have, according to this system. Maybe not the most dissonant, but the most complex. So that's another thing that we could talk about, the difference between dissonance and complexity. But, so um, talking about the mirrors, um, one thing that's interesting about grouping mirrors together, I mean, set class theory does this, um, but um, what happens is that if you have two chords that are mirrors of one another, they share a lot of similar sounds, because for those of you who know set class theory, they've got the same interval vector. So they've got the same intervals in them, they're just ordered in a different way. Um, so for example here, you, just, you can see the way it's mirrored here. Um, but what's interesting is that, say if I transpose these both to start on C, so instead of having this one on E flat, I transpose it and now it's on C. So it would be C, then skip one, D, A, and then its mirror is, or rather the original is C, G, A, and the mirror is C, D, A, right? Those two have really similar sonorities. It, they almost, they could be completely interchangeable. So then, uh, because of that, you could use both of them in the same chord progression, and it just seems natural for that to happen. Major and minor chords are mirrors of one another. And so, you know, we, they have very similar sonorities. So that's useful, grouping mirrors together. Um, and what I started to notice is that each one of these trichords has like a really distinctive quality. So this is trichord five. Um, and it sounds like it's major seventh chords with the fifth and no third, or with the third and no fifth. Uh, that's how I think of that one. But if I play them all in order from simplest to most complex, you'll get a sense of, of the different qualities of them. So trichord one, trichord two, two mirror, three, three mirror, four, and then it doesn't have a mirror because it's symmetrical. Then uh, five, five mirror, six, six mirror, seven, seven mirror, eight, so dominant chord, eight mirror, then nine, which is a diminished chord, so no mirror, nine, ten, also no mirror, it's also symmetrical, uh, eleven, eleven mirror, and twelve. Right, so we hear how that goes from trichord one and two, you know, simple sonorities, to more complex things, 
So already then you can think, okay, I want something really like kind of grating for this section. Well, use trichords that are further up on the scale. You know, you're gonna use 11 or 10 or something like that. That already gives you a pretty good map to start with. And, um, and the other thing is that once you start getting to know them a little better, you start seeing that they've got really particular, they've each got like a, a particular character. So um, what I'll do is I'll just play uh, some examples. Just recently I've been writing these, these little pieces for, uh, so they're just like sketches of things basically, uh, but these little pieces for uh, solo piano. And uh, I gave myself the, I've wanted to do this for a long time, just to try writing a bunch of pieces that use only one trichord. And just use that one as much as possible, because there are some that I never really use that much, you know? So um, here's an example of one with trichord three, which is major and minor chords. So. So that has a particular sound to it, and if you compare it to another one, like this one, this one's using trichord four, which is basically uh, a snippet of a whole tone scale, right? So just two whole tones in a row. It has this kind of clustery quality, and so, you know, it gives this sound. And it can give many different sounds, but... Uh, So already that gives you an impression of, okay, it's got a different kind of character to it. And that's, I find that really, really interesting that you can get to know these different characters, you know? Uh, and then this one, uh, trichord seven, has, it's a tritone plus either a fifth or a major seventh above the starting note. So it has this kind of percussive quality, and I wanted to kind of explore that a little bit more, the kind of percussive sound to it.
Liverpool Giants. <laughs> 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 yeah. Probably, yeah. Trust, trust us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you know what I've been listening to. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that already something, having a tool that, that can give you access to different characters like that, like that's just super useful. Um, the next thing is that um, you can use all of these different characters but apply the same principles to all of them. So um, basically those principles are, um, I usually stack trichords. It's rare that I just use three notes just like that. I mean, it happens, but you know, I write contemporary music, so I'm going to be fancier than that. <laughs> so um, the idea is that it's always through stacking trichords, right? So the first principle is, okay, if you take the same trichord, stack one of itself on top of itself, if one of them, uh, if they're far away from each other on the circle of fifths, you end up with a complex sonority, right? So this is just the same trichord transposed a tritone away, right? Whereas if they're closer together, then it sounds simpler, right? And then that's really handy because then you could just have chord progressions where you literally just hold one steady and then transpose the other one to go further and further away. And then it comes back around the circle. And that creates, creates a really clear form to it, right? And so that's really powerful. You just go, I'm gonna go towards more tension and then less tension just by transposing one of them. Um, so that's one thing. Then there's the issue of directionality or, or sharpness and flatness. If the top chord is transposed, um, is sharp in relation to the bottom chord, the overall sonority will be sharp. So if you do something like this, then you end up with a sharp sonority. If you take this top one and you instead transpose it to a flatter tonal region, so this is on C and on E, if instead the top one is on A flat, then you end up with a darker sonority, right? And so you can move to this kind of minorish sound over time, you know, or, or so. sonority right so you could take those principles and then apply them to any trichord other than the really complex ones because you have no idea where they are in the first place right um, they're just complex no matter what you do <laughs> but at, at least with the simpler ones it gives you a set of principles that are really simple just stack in one direction or the other and stack far away or close together and You've got syntax right there, you know? Um, so here's just an example of a chord progression that creates really clear um, uh, phrases because you've got um, the top chord progression is moving uh, sharper and sharper against a steady bass. of moving, uh, we go to a simple sonority again, and then the bottom one goes sharper and sharper. So if the bottom one goes sharper and sharper, and the top one stays the same, then the top one is actually getting flatter and flatter in relation to the bottom one, right? So you've got this weird contradiction where the sonority is getting flatter and flatter, but you're moving sharp-wise. So that happens a lot in music, actually. While you move sharp-wise, there's a kind of increase in tension but the individual sonorities get flatter and flatter. That's something that's used all over the place because the diatonic system kind of works like that. So um, here's just an example of how that, how that plays out. Where's my nose? something flat. Um, so I could talk about a whole bunch of different like kind of techniques um, f 
from different passages, but I thought that maybe the best thing to do would be, uh, you know, because I could say, okay, I delineate sections, I have overall goal orientations and things like that, but maybe the best thing to do is just to listen to a movement um, of music that I wrote and kind of try to hear in these in this way without me kind of directing you too much. So just try and listen for increases in, in tension and in complexity, uh, motion towards bright things, motion to dark things, contrasts between those. And um, I think this movement from one of my pieces, what the hell? Here, there we go, okay. Uh, this movement from this piece should be one of the clearest things I've written in terms of harmony. So. So that's basically it. Um, I could play more examples from my music, but I think that covers pretty much all of the aspects of what I wanted to talk about in terms of harmony. So the idea is that the circle of fifths, because of the fact that it could be used as a tool for analysis and composition, <coughs> it means that you can use it as a tool for listening as well as a tool for composing. And that's really important because you want the way that you compose to be, I mean, kind of when I sketch an idea out, I think of it in terms of transcribing what's happening in my head. So if the tools that you're using to compose and the tools that you're using to listen and transcribe are completely different things, then, then there's a bridge that needs to be yapped, right? And, um, and, and it also allows you to do things like, you know, listen to Beethoven and then hear like, oh, there's this motion sharp wise and then bam, a complete change. And you associate that with other dimensions of the music that are changing at the same time. And you start to understand something fundamental about music 
that you can then apply to your own music in a simpler or more complex way or whatever you want. So um, it's, a, it's a really a interesting way of thinking, I think. And uh, in terms of potential that this would have is that since it's something that can be used, um, like you could do these analyses with a computer, uh, it could be possible to try and uh, analyze harmony just for MIDI files and things, you know? And that would be great because then, you know, you could look up like, I want to see all the examples of this type of trichord in all of the history of Western music. Go, you know, if you've got the database for that. But, you know, database is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so that would, you know, it would uh, open up a lot of tools uh, for uh, another way of thinking about music. So, yeah. Any questions? I have a couple, actually. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Um, Yeah, because uh, you, you did mention uh, there was a difference between complexity and, um, and dissonance, dissonance, right? Because yeah. I guess dissonance would be kind of in harmonicity, right? Whether or not it kind of lines up with the harmonic series. Yeah, and uh, I, I think of dissonance as being uh, sensory dissonance. So the idea is that when two frequencies are within the same uh, critical band, then it causes a kind of vibration. Uh, yeah. And that has to do with just the auditory processing system. So when you hear the beats of the uh, two yeah, uh, exactly. right, frequencies merging, yeah, because because then uh, when we think about the complexity of notes, it's you know uh, you hear it as stacked fifths in a way, kind of you know making up the space between well, uh, this relationship in a way, right? Because uh, it's funny because uh, how would I put that the my instinct, my first instinct for the complexity of intervals would be how how low, how do you find it, you know, in the lowest range of the harmonic series, right? So the right. first one would be a, the, the octave, then the fifth, then the third. Yeah. And then... That's know. what I initially thought, and that's what yeah. I was trying to play off of. And it didn't seem to work. Like, like I was really trying to incorporate thirds into this thing, and it just, like, it was just impossible. I think I've got an idea of why that's the case now, but at the time it was like, what the hell, like, um, I think what it is is that I think there's a way of calculating the complexity of a, an individual uh, number, and so like like say somehow eight is a simpler number than seven, right? Because you can divide it, and like the brain is like ah eight, like that's fine, but mm -hmm. seven is a more complex number for some reason, yeah. and I found uh, just a way of being able to calculate that, like the the. And it, it worked out pretty well. Like so, like sixteen would be a simpler number than five, you know, and so on and so forth. And I think that the complexity of an interval is actually based on that. And if you use that as a, um, a kind of guide, then the third has it's a ratio of uh, two to five, or, or four to five, or yeah. whatever to five, right? And five ends up being more complex than nine, which is a major ninth. Right? Yeah. And then with six, it's tricky because it depends how you tune it, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these things also depend on the tuning too. Yeah, that was my hypothesis because yeah. the closest thing that we get to get a proper scale, but that's what we use the circle of fifth to generate scales, you know, the yeah. line of the scale, that's why it comes from because you know, if you just take two, which is the simplest, you get the octave, you just get one pitch class, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then if you use uh, other interval than fifths, then you, you get outside the equal temperance. So maybe because those intervals are tempered, yeah. equally tempered, the closest thing that your brain can think of is the fifth to yeah. get to these other notes. So that, that's maybe yeah. why that's was awesome. thinking that. Yeah, because I don't know, at some point, at some point your brain must have to switch to thinking like this is, this is like three fifths or this is like another type of justly tuned interval. So right. it, it's not clear where the brain makes that kind of a categorical switch, maybe, I'm not sure. So that's, that's like a big topic to try and get into, yeah. you know, for quarter tone stuff. The first question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, oh yeah, when you had the progression with the sudden uh, AP changes, yeah. like when, when you had the bass, I, I was wondering because you did have the relative AP of the whole chord change yeah. suddenly, but that also coincided with 
the fact that the bass note would move sharp or flat wise, yeah. you know, major third either direction. Yeah. I was wondering if you did the same, like, but with with the bass uh, not moving as you know uh, clearly in one direction or another, right. another. With, with the effect, with the same, with the same AP difference. In make a way. the same kind if of effect. If it would make the same effect, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, it'd be hard to because I can't do the calculations on the spot, but. Um, I mean, it's always clearer when you've got a, a clear bass note, you know, yeah. and that's why I did those examples like that, you know, you've got the clear bass note and then it switches, because at first you kind of need that to start hearing what's going on. And then, and then if you start doing changes like, like that's really unclear, I mean, obviously now I'm moving a tritone, so like obviously that's unclear in what direction we're going in, but that, I really hear that as a flat-wise motion. Like, it doesn't seem like you're moving in a positive direction there, right? And yet all the voice leading is super close and stuff, and the bass was staying the same. So you could do things, actually, I mean, the clearest thing is, is changing with a steady bass. You're moving in a flat-wise or sharp-wise direction, but then, then you're then it's hard to differentiate that from just changing in terms of sharp and flat sonorities if the bass stays the same. This is obviously flatter, but it's also a flatter sonority, so, so you've got to kind of change the bass if you want to have um, um, the, same, the same sharpness, flatness between the two chords, but a change of AP, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Huh. <coughs> and my third question was: yeah. uh, When you use the poly trichords, um, mm -hmm. you calculate because it's funny because uh, this works because they both have the same structure, right? Because mm -hmm. your brain recognizes this pattern, so it kind of makes a relationship between the two. And then, when you have this, the relation if this is uh, sharp towards the bass one. Because you hear this pattern, you're going to say, oh, it's twice the same thing, so it sounds, you know, this or right. this way. But it's kind of very specific to this use of six note chords, right? So I was wondering if you actually have these chords intersect. So if, let, let's say, for example, if, you know, the, the bass note of the upper trichord and the upper note of the lower trichord, you know, are... Um, yeah. That yeah. happens in my ensemble. Does it? Yeah. And does yeah. it? Is it as clear? Does the brain kind of still separate these two? Well, it doesn't separate them into trichords anymore, uh, because, like, say for example, there is a passage in that in my ensemble piece. There, I wonder if I could just get it quickly. But oh, why does it always do this? I don't understand. The sound changes uh, here with the um, the. Uh, the mallet percussions. Yeah. Let's see if I can pull it up. Uh, so here. So this is trichord two, and they're crossing. So. When they cross, it gets more complex because it all intermingles. was that they're both doing um, a similar harmonic progression, but the top one is just moving the voicing down. So it starts off flat, right. but then because the top trichord crosses over and goes below it, the flatter one ends up below, and so it ends up sharp. And in between, you end up with this complex mess. Right, right, right. Right? But Isn't there's still a, a continuity to the whole thing somehow. Yeah. You know? So the SF is at, at its clearest when the two are clearly separate. separated, yeah. right? Yeah. Because I was wondering, how will you analyze an uh, eight note chord that's not, you know, right. a poly chord? Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't really analyze it when I'm composing. It's just a, a tool to go fast. <laughs> like, right. you yeah, know, yeah. So an eight note chord or whatever note chord, I would analyze it using the, 
the, the tools that I presented at the beginning, you know, with the actually doing an analysis and getting an actual complexity value. Because when I'm doing chords like this, I'm not thinking, of, I have no idea what this would, this would be like a six or a seven in terms of, I have no idea, you know. Um, so I'm not really thinking in that way. Um, so, so I wouldn't, that's the tricky part. So if I'm analyzing something, I can analyze something in terms of the trichords, and that's handy because then I can directly apply it to what I do. But generally, I analyze it in more of a vague sense, like just thinking in terms of, of sharp-wise and flat-wise motion and the general principles, and then I apply it to my trichord system. So trichords don't really work so well for analysis. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. most music is not yeah. like that. Yeah, course. exactly. Yeah. wonder how... Uh, Ah, that would work so well to analyze. Uh, what's the name of the guy who wrote the tonal clock? Um, the tonal clock? Yeah, he came up with a system. It's based on the fact that you only have twelve, uh, you know, possible yeah. pitch class set, and yeah. he gave a specific. It's really funny because, like he says, like this one sounds like a, a a day with you know gray clouds in the sky, oh, and this man, one sounds like a spring breeze or something like that. <laughs> yeah, and he gives kind of a personality to each one, and <coughs> he said, sorry, that each kind of si harmonic system should have three, uh, so four actually, you know, complementary uh, trichords, so that you have you know all huh. the all the pitches covered, and then that these would have different personalities. So oh, he tried to came up with all wow, the possible combinations. Sh 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 something S C H. That's yeah. Ah, oh, damn it. It's really funny, but he wrote a piece with that, and I, I would be really curious to yeah, see it analyze that, with that. Yeah, that would yeah. be good, because then I could just do a direct analysis, like, oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah. No, that's a good idea. What the hell is his name? <laughs> uh, s s uh, I want to say Schubert, but it's like... No, yeah. No. Google Tom of Black and Fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any question? Is it guys chapeau en français? What? Euh, J'ai manqué le début, vraiment désolé. Euh, ah, c'est que l'introduction était un peu rude sur le coup. <rire> je me demandais justement, parce que là c'était ta conclusion qui m'a confirmé un peu sur surtout par toi-même. Est-ce que ouais. justement c'était basé sur, puis désolé si ça fait répéter un peu, mais est-ce que c'était basé sur déjà des analyses qui avaient déjà été faites, des théories ou des observations euh, vraiment personnelles Parce que moi j'ai deux, peut-être penser à deux choses vraiment très claires que j'avais déjà vues. Là. Ok, euh, ouais, ben, c'est comme, il y a du monde qui avait. Euh, ben, j'ai parlé de comment les modes, on parlait des modes en termes de, de euh, des modes plus bright puis plus dark. Okay, à cause ça, de, tu vas dire en jazz, il parle beaucoup de exactement. ça, Exactement. Alors, ça, c'était la première chose okay. que j'ai dit, en fait. Il y a ça, puis en fait, en particulier, euh, euh, Jacob Collier, euh, je ne sais pas si tu le connais, un, 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 un musicien jazz qui, jazz, qui fait euh, euh, des arrangements, euh, qui joue tous les instruments, puis vraiment un... un c'est incroyable. Puis lui, il parle beaucoup de ça. Puis il parle de ça en termes de negative harmony. Mais lui, il parlait de... de c'est quoi le nom du gars? Un théoricien qui euh, parle de comment si tu, si tu flippes une harmonie autour d'un axe, mm. euh, le, tu peux avoir comme l'harmonie euh, euh, négative mm -hmm. en relation à celle-là. Alors, comme l'harmonie négative d'un accord de dominant, c'est comme, c'est quelque chose comme, c'est quoi? Ah, oh, tu peux faire, c'est... C'est quelque chose comme ça. Alors, tu peux faire, au lieu de faire 5, 1, tu fais... Euh, C'était quoi, là? C'était quelque chose comme, comme ça. Puis ça, ça, le résultat de ça, lui, il parle de ça, puis il dit, « Ah, les harmonies négatives, c'est comme, c'est l'autre côté du cercle de quinte, puis c'est comme the dark side of things. Mm. Uh, and there's the positive side of things, tu sais. » Alors lui, il parle en termes de négatif et positif, beaucoup. Uh, puis en jazz, c'est comme, il y a beaucoup de monde qui parle de ça. Puis même l'autre jour, j'ai checké parce que je voulais voir si c'était vraiment quelque chose que beaucoup de monde parlait de ça. Puis il y avait un gars en ligne qui avait dit comme exactement la même chose que moi, mais lui, il parle de, de juste les notes euh, euh, à partir de la, la note de base. Mm -hmm. Alors, 
il analyse pas tous les intervalles dans l'accord. Puis ça, c'est vraiment important, surtout si tu fais de la musique contemporaine, tu sais, parce qu'il n'y a pas de fondamental, mm -hmm. tu sais. Alors lui, il pense en termes de fondamental, puis en jazz, surtout, on, on pense dans ces termes-là. Alors, euh, cette pensée-là, elle existe déjà euh, quand on pense en termes de fondamental, mm -hmm. mais pas en musique contemporaine, j'ai pas vu ça. Non plus. Puis, quand on parle, par exemple, euh, je ne plus c'est dans quel livre pour ça, mais quand on ouais. enseignait les accords polytonaux, on ouais. parlait de triades majeures et mineures, il y avait exactement le même genre ah, de ouais. système aussi, genre si tu veux superposer ton accord majeur au-dessus, ouais. plus proche des bémols, ben, c'est plus dark, etc. Ouais. Mais quand tu parlais de ça, je me suis dit c'est une version plus large, qui pourrait s'appliquer à tout le langage harmonique, mm. mais de, de ceux qui existent, je me demandais justement, parce que tu as marqué juste à la fin euh, General Observations, je me suis dit. Comme, ouais. Tu as sûrement eu le temps de regarder un petit peu. Ouais, ça. Et l'autre chose, ça, ça revient un peu à ce que tu as dit, en fait, euh, tu n'as pas parlé de disposition du tout, de registre par exemple. Ah, de registre. Je manquais peut-être ça au début. Ouais. Tu parlais par exemple du spectre harmonique. Pour moi, le spectre harmonique, ce n'est pas une façon de voir si ton accord est dissonant. C'est une façon de, 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 de l'espacer, de, de, de disposer dans. Ouais. Juste maintenant, dans le spectre des auteurs. Donc, c'est certain que le, 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 le paramètre dark puis bright joue énormément. Des intervalles, mm -hmm. probablement plus sur l'espace, j'ai envie de croire qu'il gagne ou il perd. Je sais pas, en fait, dans s'il gagne ou il perd de. Ouais. Euh, alors, dans ma façon d'analyser les trucs, euh, je sais pas, même peut-être j'ai mis ça à la fin, là, mais euh, à date, euh, je prends en considération euh, le voicing, alors les, les notes qui sont plus graves ont plus d'impact. Euh, alors, euh, L'exemple que j'ai donné avant, c'était si tu as un accord comme ça, euh, tu as Do, Sol, Do, Sol, puis là, le Si ici, euh, euh, le plus qu'il y a un intervalle euh, complexe est, ou, ou sharp ou whatever est grave, le plus que ça a un impact sur l'accord. Mm -hmm. Puis c'est vraiment dans euh, ces logarithmiques. Alors ceux de la basse sont vraiment les plus importants, ceux du ténor deux fois moins important, et ainsi de suite. Alors ici, la note euh, qui est très éloignée de toutes les autres notes, c'est si, si tu le mets dans la basse, c'est beaucoup plus complexe. Euh, et euh, l'autre affaire que je prends en considération, c'est l'espacement. Alors, euh, mais pas l'espacement exact. Alors ça, c'est une chose que j'ai besoin de, de mettre dans le système d'analyse, mais euh, euh, c'est la proximité des intervalles. Alors, si un intervalle consiste de deux notes, disons dans cet accord-là, euh, je peux changer le voicing, puis là, faire ça, puis ça va être beaucoup plus complexe parce que c'est plus dense. Mais aussi, à cause du fait que dans ce voicing-ci, tous les accords, euh, tous les intervalles euh, euh, adjacents, Adjacent. Adjacent. Mmh. Oui. Mmh. <rire> <Okay. rire> euh, sont, euh, euh, sont simples. Alors, euh, seconde majeure, carte, majeure, majeure. Dans ce cas-ci, c'est toutes des secondes mineures, c'est oui. toutes des intervalles euh, plus complexes. Euh, mais je ne prends pas en considération euh, l'espacement euh, exact. Alors, dans mon analyse, cet accord-là et cet accord-là serait analysé de la même façon parce que l'ordre est la même. Mm -hmm. Mais clairement, il y a un, un gros différence entre ces deux-là. Alors ça, c'est pas, j'ai juste pas pris le temps de faire non, ça non, encore. Mais oui, ben, c'est en fait. ouais. ouais. Justement, quand tu parles de l'importance euh, de la base en termes de justement la, la cl... le, le sharp ou le flat, ouais. c'est pour ça que souvent justement en musique métal, tu auras un, un ostinato où tu auras des accords, puis là c'est la basse qui, pendant qu'elle se meut, que là tu as tout justement le, 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 ouais. espèce d'éventail, euh, justement les, les perceptions que, ouais. dont tu parles. Ouais, ouais. Je sais ouais. j'ai remarqué aussi quand tu as une série de, mettons, d'accords qui sont des séries d'harmoniques, puis tu les arranges en voice leading pour que ce soit le plus consonant possible, fait que tu n'as pas nécessairement la fondamentale en bas, tu vas voir la quinte ou quelque chose comme ça. Si es fond, ta fondamentale, a suit une gamme chromatique ascendante, en fait ça va flat wise, dans ouais. parce que ça, ça step de 2, euh, pas de 2 mais de 4 en fait, c'est ça. De 5. 5 en fait, ouais, ouais. c'est ça. Puis, plus, puis si tu fais une gamme chromatique descendante, ça devient sharp wise. Ouais. Fait que tout mais... le rapport de sensible à tonique, c'est ça, c'est que tu passes ouais. de super sharp à quelque chose de super. Euh... Oui. 
de ça. super relaxant, tandis que se prend la, la septième de ta dominante, puis tu descends à la tierce, tu penses à quelque chose qui veut descendre, à quelque chose qui est comme majeur, qui est comme c'est ça. Right. Ouais. Puis c'est pour ça que comme ce ouais. triton là qui se résout sur la tierce de majeur, c'est tellement le parfait équilibre ouais. des deux directions opposées. Ouais. Puis en plus, c'est que c'est, c'est, c'est pas juste ça, c'est que dans le système diatonique, c'est les deux notes les plus éloignées qui se rapprochent tout d'un coup. En plus, il y a la, la... une autre chose, je parlais avec Bill Kaplan de ça, c'est que en musique tonale, souvent tu as 4, 5, 1. T'sais? Puis ça c'est intéressant parce que si tu as un Do, c'est Fa, Sol, Do. C'est vraiment, c'est comme tu fais le tour, puis normalement tu commences sharp, puis là tu vas jusqu'au Fa, Sol, Do. C'est comme, ça c'est vraiment intéressant ça comme concept. Puis, euh, ouais, il y a, y a plein d'affaires de même que tu peux analyser dans, dans la musique classique. Tu sais, toutes les voice leading, c'est tout parfaitement fait de cette manière-là. Tu sais, c'est comme vraiment cool. Mais ça, c'est un modèle d'analyse que tu peux porter sur peu importe le genre. Euh, c'est ça. Puis il y a ouais. J'ai une question. J'ai peut-être ma terminologie en anglais qui est problématique quand je pensais. C'est le sac des gaffes, le fifth, pour prendre le terme que tu as utilisé. Euh, le prof d'harmonie tonale en moi pensait un cassette, un, un cassette 3, 6, 2, 5, 1. C'est pas du tout le même sac. En fait, ah, il ouais. Je me demandais s'il y avait deux termes. Quand tu fais la progression euh, tonale classique, mm-hmm. c'est du circle of fifth aussi? Oui, on c'est utilise tu... le même terme, on dit uh, circle of fifth progression. Ben, ouais. Mon feeling, c'est ça, c'est la même chose. Puis quand je suis arrivé, je dis, attends, ça marche pas dans mon sens horaire habituel. Hein? Oui. Il faut que je passe à l'envers. Alors, euh, euh, normalement, c'est. Ouais, parce que. C'est tu un penses cassette 3, 3, 3, c'est ça, c'est ça. Ouais. C'est, c'est, c'est le contraire. Ouais, ouais. Hein. ouais, c'est ça. Autre question? Non. Are there any times where, like, a situation where some other parameter will, like, fool your perception of yes. sharpness, flatness, or whenever one of those things? <laughs> I have a slide for that. <laughs> Conflicting parameters. This is, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so for one thing, there's um, density. It seems like denser things we associate with with flatness, because it's like more complex. And and for some reason, there's this association. And I'm trying to uh, parse it. I've got a few like theories, but I'm not entirely sure yet. But often we associate like dense things with flatness because it's like closed and it gives the same impression of, of wanting to close up at least for for me and so you can have something that's bright like this chord down here technically harmonically bright right but if you hear that this, that's dark because it's so freaking low you know so So the terms bright and dark don't really work that well because because then you've got tons of uh, conflicting parameters because lots of things uh, um, contribute to our perception of darkness and brightness, right? So register is definitely, uh, so register, density, those two things are really important. Answer things seem to be like close and, and darker. And, you know, if you take the same thing, technically within my way of analyzing things, which obviously isn't perfect, because this is the same thing as this. Because the order of the notes is the same. C, C sharp, D, right? But clearly those are two completely different things. Um, And so register and dissonance. So dissonance, that's what I was talking about in terms of, we were just talking about before, in terms of the difference between uh, sensory dissonance and And complexity. So, the higher something is in sensory dissonance, often uh, it's like they kind of co-vary. Like complex things tend to be dissonant as well, but not always. Like the augmented chord, it's dissonant, not really, because because there's no grading intervals, you know. But it's definitely complex because you can't point out where it is. It's like it's it's everywhere at once. So. So yeah, there's tons of things like that. And probably if I were to get into timbre and things like that, yeah. then I mean, it's a whole world of things. Yeah. Good? Right. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you.